Hello everyone and welcome back to Pints with Jack and today I'm recording in my wardrobe. I don't normally do this but we are moving to Wisconsin and so our apartment is basically empty because all of our stuff is on its way there already but I wanted to give the listeners an opportunity to see where I am normally recording when I'm recording the audio podcast. And it's also very appropriate because today uh, I have a guest on who is going to be talking about a Catholic guide to Narnia. Now, on the podcast, we're made up of uh, two Catholics, one Roman, one Byzantine, and an Episcopalian seminarian. So the subject of Catholicism comes up a lot, but we haven't focused on it too much recently. But with today's guest, I get to indulge. So Colin McIver, welcome to Pies for Jack. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here. I've got my wardrobe behind me. I haven't, I haven't gone in yet. <laughs> well, just remember, do not close the door because it is a very foolish thing to do to lock oneself in a wardrobe. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, before we get going, could you just fill in a little bit of your background? Uh, just, just personally, wh wh what's your background? Where have you come from? What have you been doing? Okay. Well, so I'll start with, uh, I'm here today uh, representing Ascension. Uh, Ascension is a, a Catholic publishing company. We're known to, to many um, recently because of, of Father Mike's Bible in a Year, which uh, has been doing very well. We also do a lot of things in terms of trying to resource parishes and schools with, with creative programs that we think are going to really engage uh, young people, adults, um, the whole wide gamut. So we have, we have a, a mission really to, to bring the good and the true and the beautiful into, into the church and the world, into families and homes. And uh, I have been working with Ascension for quite some time as, as a writer, a content creator, and, and right now, actually, I'm, I'm in my classroom at St. Scholastica Academy in Covington, Louisiana, where I am also the campus minister, as uh, many people who do Catholic ministry wear a few different hats from their wardrobe. So I, I uh, teach at a girls' school as well, and so does my wife. Uh, we share the classroom, and we also uh, co-author resources together. Wonderful. And so in your own journey, where did C.S. Lewis begin to feature? Goodness. Okay. So for me, I guess I would say early on, um, the, the BBC Narnia was probably my first foray as, as a very, uh, a very young guy. Um, but I would say my next encounter with Lewis was really as a philosophy undergrad, mm. who was probably reading Abolition of Man and uh, getting a little scared about the world around me and what <laughs> was happening and thinking like, Gaius and Titius had nothing going, you know? Um, and then, uh, then it went a little deeper. I think in grad school, I read the Space Trilogy. And, um, and then as a young dad, uh, got back into Narnia, just really wanting to, to read it to my children, seeing the value of, of cultivating uh, an imagination, a, a metaphysical framework that, that cracks open the world of, of understanding Christ, of understanding the good, the true, and the beautiful. And so uh, we started reading Narnia at night. My son is going to be born in a few weeks from now, and a large part of, of why I'm so looking forward to be a father is just because I get to read all the books that I read as a child. Uh, and even better than that, my friends will buy these books again for me. It's wonderful. Uh, so Ascension has brought out this book, A Catholic Guide to Narnia. What was its genesis? Where did it come from? What was the idea behind it? So the Genesis was actually the movie release back in the day. I believe it was 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of the things we've done throughout the years is try to, wh what are the threads in culture that we can grab onto and really invite people deeper? So we knew that a lot of people had been gravitating toward the film. And uh, I still find this to be true, that a lot of a lot of young people get into Narnia and they have no idea that there's any kind of Christian framework there. As a matter of fact, uh, my confirmation candidates, just this last weekend, I, I brought up something about Aslan being a parallel to Christ and their heads exploded. And my head exploded that their heads exploded. I was like, didn't, didn't you figure that out? What do they teach in school these days? <laughs> I actually had one guest who was doing the same thing with a college student. And, and she said, I don't understand why people say Narnia is a, is a Christian thing. And he says, well, can you think of another story where there is this great, powerful person who dies for the sake of, of, of others and then comes back to life? And she goes, oh, you mean like Gandalf and Lord of the Rings? <laughs> and then Tolkien's head explodes. <laughs> <laughs> Your allegories are too on the nose, too. <laughs> Never. Um, Not allegory. <laughs> Supposal. 
<laughs> okay, so you were writing that, but that movie was a while ago. So that was a while ago. What happened? Did somebody lose the email? No. So so the book w- was out and it was published and it and it did well. And um, maybe about a year and a half ago, uh, a light bulb went off that. Uh, that Narnia is not just a movie. And and the movies, by the way, are still widely used. Um, I don't think I've ever taught a freshman theology class and not shown it in order to to try to to, to weave. If, if it seems like I'm trying to cast a bit of a spell, it's because I am. You know, that so, Enchantments are also used for breaking spells. <laughs> I, there you go. Yeah. We read that in my philosophy class. It's the best week of the entire year. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we thought this would be just a useful resource and just kind of talking around the community of religious educators and parish folks. There are a lot of people who use still the movie Narnia and looking into the family world. Um, some of us on the team were, were talking to, to fellow parents and it was like, sort of like, raise your hand if you read your kids Narnia at some point and every hand in the room goes up um, because it's, it's uh, something that many do and something that we would hope more families would get involved in. And then maybe some some homeschool groups or, or maybe those who are in parish schools of religious education and they're, they're thinking, what's something we could do over the summer that would really draw our sixth or seventh graders in? Well, maybe we could have a Narnia study. Maybe they could actually read the book and mm. then maybe watch the movie later or go back and watch the BBC version. So it's classic. <laughs> that was the one I grew up with. <laughs> It, it is. So, so we realized that we already had a, a, a good resource and we thought if we just take this and maybe untether it a bit from the movie, if we add some catechism references, um, a bit more scripture, and then some activities that could be useful, whether you want to be creative at home or you want to have fun at your youth group or wherever this might be used, um, we thought we might have something that would be really useful to folks out there and, and reinvigorate a, a love of Narnia and maybe save civilization by resurrecting um, a metaphysical framework that will lead people to a Tao of value. Mm -hmm. Okay, in that case, I I now want to talk about the audience. You've alluded to it a little bit, but uh, maybe we should talk about the content before Mm -hmm. we talk about that. So what is actually in this book? I had the opportunity to look through an electronic copy, but could you tell uh, the viewers, what will people find when they crack open this volume? So there's a simple walkthrough of, of the who's who, uh, a little bit about who C.S. Lewis is, a little bit about the genesis of, of the book and the series, and um, even a, a simple insight into what order it should go in, which is a, a bit of a debate that Lewis himself entered. There's no debate. There's no debate. Publication order. I actually noticed one of your discussion questions was about that. I don't, to me, that's like inviting a child. It's like, which one of the Ten Commandments do you really think is not that important? It's like, no. <laughs> You do not discuss this. You just accept this publication order and we are done. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm less charitable than Lewis, if you might have noticed. We wait into anyway. the controversy a little bit. <laughs> but the other thing that we do in there is just to, to go through the different chapters and episodes and facets and, and to just walk through um, really with a simple format of question and response. You know, mm-hmm. what are some of the pivotal, pivotal questions that we would want a viewer or a reader of Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe to ask that would cause them to, to go deeper and to, uh, to get more out of it? And then following that, we have some objective comprehension kinds of questions. Nothing tough that's going to stress anybody out, um, but just to make sure that we're viewing and maybe reviewing a little bit. And then some deeper discussion questions to follow. Um, what we've added in this edition, too, there's a, a, a quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church because I, in in every facet of Narnia, there's there's some deep truth about the the deep magic mm-hmm. uh, that can be uh, explored. There's a scripture quote, and then at the end, um, there are activities, everything from posters to little skits that can be done, um, with the idea that not every activity is going to be done. There may be some who sit down and say, "Well, we're just going to talk," and that, that's fine. Um, but I know that as a as a classroom teacher, I'm often looking for, especially if I'm teaching, let's say between seventh and ninth graders, uh, they love to make do skits and posters, and um, so we thought if we added all that in there, we might have a really versatile um, resource. You know, so it, one of the things that I think is great about this is that it could work at home and it could mm-hmm. work in a classroom like the one that I'm sitting in, um, in a more formal school setting, or it could work at a, at a youth group night and also be a lot of fun because of the activities. So I think this is a, a really versatile thing that we have. 
Yeah, as I was reading through, I was trying to think how I might use this in those different settings. I think, yes, definitely get them to to read or at least listen to that chapter first. And that this book could be used uh, just purely as the teacher for you to review the material and see the sorts of things that are good prompting questions to ask uh, the children doing it. Uh, but at the same time, you could even use it as a textbook so the kids are actually reading through the questions and answers themselves. I actually did chuckle a little bit because uh, I grew up on some of the older catechisms that were of question and answer, you know, who made you? God made me. Why did God make you? God made me to know him, love him and serve him in this world and be happy with him forever in the next. I And I chuckled to myself as like, this is totally the sort of thing I would get my son to uh, memorize. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. it's, it's like the But now Narnia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you can you can use it in in all of those different ways. And at the end, you also had an appendix where you pretty much connect each of the each of the elements to both the books and also the timestamps for the movies, yes. which I thought was really rather neat. So if if the kids have done well in the class, okay, kids, we're actually now going to watch the clips of the things that we've talked about, right? Or watch the whole movie because let's face it, they always want to watch the whole movie. <laughs> and and as much as I think. The books are far superior. The movie's not bad. I've, I've never, I've never had my kids put it on once and then walked up and done something else. I always get drawn in, especially mm -hmm. the the battle scene is is really well. My, my wife will constantly allude to when when the cheetahs like run ahead and, and collide and just this sort of uh, great eschatological battle that's happening. So, uh, the, the the movie's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Now. There are other books and other movies. Are there plans to reproduce this for Prince Caspian and, and the rest of the Narniad? We are open to it. It's it's not currently in production, but I would say there is a high level of openness and interest. And, and we'll see how useful this is to folks that if, uh, if people are out there using this and there's demand for it, then we would love nothing more than to, uh, to produce something like that. Because th these kinds of things are a lot of fun to write too. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what about yourself? Have you got any other projects in the pipeline that you can tell us about, Narnia or non-Narnia related? Oh, wow. We've got a, we've got a lot going on right now. Um, so we just worked on uh, a program called Connected, which is about Catholic social teaching for teens. And we are hoping to... Um, to really open up some, some conversations with young people about the world around them, about the dignity of the human person, about um, it's there aren't any direct allusions to Lewis, but anytime I work on a resource, I know he's, <laughs> I have, I have Lewis sitting on one shoulder, JP2 sitting on another shoulder. Um, my my co-host Matt is the same. When he, when he was giving a talk at his local church, before he went up, somebody said to him, listen, two Lewis quotations, max, okay? <laughs> I think he blew through that in the first 30 seconds, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would say that that resource is one of the most current things we've been working on. Also, um, we're working on a, a program to do Bible timeline with teens. It's a revision of a, a former program. A lot of what we're trying to do is take things that have been solid and helpful and bring them to, uh, to the world now in 2021, which is way different than it was even in 2011. So yeah. uh, there are a lot of those kinds of things. Um, there is a, a book called Whisper that just came out um, that I know a lot of a lot of my colleagues and friends have been getting a lot of, out of, of just about general spirituality. But uh, at Ascension, we really run the gamut of a, a lot of different kinds of resources and books and podcasts, and it's a really exciting company to be a part of. I'm sure. I'm sure. I've got Goma from Every Knee Shall Bow scheduled to come on before the end of this season, uh, and so I'm just bracing myself for that experience. That will be a fun <laughs> interview. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Colin, thanks so much for coming on, talking about the, the book. Uh, can Before we wrap up, can you tell people where they can find the book Absolutely. and any, any other resources you want to advertise? Super simple. So ascensionpress.com backslash Narnia or in your wardrobe. It's already in there waiting for you. <laughs> uh, can you add another one if you could have Ascension Press slash uh, Speum? That would be great. That would be even cooler. <laughs> a fawn comes out and just don't drink that tea. That's don't drink the tea. 
<laughs> or, 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 or you sort of have a, a, a fawn come out on one side and a white witch come, animates it to come out on the other. Just like, which do you want, tea or Turkish delight? Yeah, and Turkish delights are really good, but... Uh... Oh, you actually like Turkish delight. See, I have to deal with Americans all the time saying, oh, I tried it, it's revolting. No, it's um, But I mean, I grew up on it. I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't quite as exotic as I, as I think it is for, for many people. But you, know, it, you have good Turkish delight, you have bad Turkish delight. But... When we had our C.S. Lewis group here, virtually everybody went, Ugh. <laughs> Although I'm the, I'm the same guy that went to Singapore and, and loved durian. And, and I like durian ice cream. And my family constantly makes fun of me. They say that my, my nickname at dinner is, sure. Like, if anything is, <laughs> would you like that? I'm like, yeah, sure. So maybe I'm not a good barometer of the actual uh, goodness of Turkish delights, but I enjoyed them. I think it's good. And actually, if you tour lewis's home the kilns in oxford at the end of the tour they give you some turkish delight they promise that it's not enchanted <laughs> see i gotta make that tour that would be awesome <laughs> that's fantastic well thank you for coming on and viewers please join us next time when we'll go further up and further in cheers <laughs>